Good morning. We do have a, a few announcements this morning. Uh, they are in your bulletin. We're going to continue to try to get our bulletins and, and announcements uh, written so we can have those before us. We have a tendency maybe to uh, remember when they're written, or maybe you can post it on your refrigerator or bulletin board at home. So uh, just a few announcements to bring to your attention this morning. A uh, reminder, Vacation Church School is June 6th to 10th at Grain Valley. Uh, June's going to be here before you know it. So uh, if you're in, uh, that's uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. at Grain Valley this year. Uh, you can contact Courtney or Elijah Brock for more details or to get signed up for Vacation Church School. There will be a memorial service this Friday evening, May 20th, here at Parkview for Debbie Herring. As you know, she passed away uh, several weeks ago, and the family uh, could be in town at this time, so there will be a memorial service for Debbie Herring here at uh, this Friday night at 7 o'clock. I would like to meet with all the deacons next Sunday after church. That's the 22nd, just for a few minutes, so be mindful of that. Uh, all deacons uh, meeting next Sunday right after church. Uh, right after church today, there's a graduation celebration for Owen Schultz and Elijah Brock that is downstairs right after the service today from 1 to 3. Uh, our potluck this month will be May 29th right after the church service, and the theme this month is barbecue. So be thinking about your favorite barbecue dishes. Look at Steve smiling already. Your favorite barbecue dish that you can bring uh, for that Sunday. Uh, so that's the last Sunday of this month, May 29th. The theme is barbecue. Uh, we also are participating in a clothing drive right now, so if you're doing that spring cleaning, it's a good time to uh, bring those items that uh, you don't uh, use or wear anymore. Uh, we're gathering those in the classroom back here uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the hallway here. Uh, there's several bags of clothes back there now, so you got till this Friday. Uh, any questions, you can contact Ted regarding that, and we'll get those. Yes, Ted. Okay, do it till Sunday. You got till next Sunday to bring those things in. So, and then uh, Ted will gather those up and get those dispersed accordingly. So, uh, just as a reminder that if you use the church facilities or for any purpose, or if you're the last one to leave after a service, please make sure that all of the doors are locked and the lights are turned off. It doesn't take just a minute to make a quick pass through downstairs and up. Uh, we've again had some issues with some doors being left unlocked. And uh, we've had some activity around the church here recently uh, uh, when nobody's here and uh, people have been uh, hanging around the facilities here. So we just need to be mindful that we keep things locked up and the lights turned off. Also, just an update, uh, I talked with Larry Driscoll this morning. He is having surgery tomorrow morning at 11.30 out at Lee Summit Hospital, and that's to repair some uh, disc damage that he had from a fall uh, just a few weeks ago. So. Be mindful of Larry uh, in your prayers, if you would, please, for that surgery tomorrow. Also, uh, Pat Costello, she took a fall Friday, I believe it was, and hit her head. And uh, she went to, by ambulance to St. Mary's Hospital, and there uh, they had to uh, shock her several times. She uh, heart stopped. So she's in ICU. Uh, talked with Dan this morning. And she's doing a little better, but she has pneumonia now on a ventilator. And so just be mindful of Pat, if you would, please. And we know there are many others on our prayer list. So just continue to uphold those as you see them come across the uh, prayer chain, our phone chain, or the Facebook page. Uh, or if you, hey, you know anybody that uh, needs assistance with prayers or something, please add them to our prayer list uh, so that we can all uphold them in our prayers. Would you bow with me this morning, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for your goodness and your blessings. Father, thankful that uh, we can gather here on this Sabbath morning. We know that the rain is falling, and we know that rain is needed upon this earth. And so we thank you for the rain, Father, as it replenishes uh, this earth that you have uh, created for us. And I pray this day we've come, Father, we would feel your presence, and you would abide with us, and you would attend us in our hour of worship as we lift up our voices in song, and as we hear your spoken word, Father, might we rejoice in your blessings and your goodness. And might we continue to uphold those who uh, are on our prayer list, that they might receive those blessings, Father, of uh, strength, of healing, of peace, that they might know, Father, you are with them. So please bless us in this hour to come and throughout this week is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we uh, open into worship this morning, I would uh, greet you. Um, there'll be two hymns that are printed in your bulletin for today, so hopefully you have a bulletin. If you don't, um, the deacons can come and hand those out to you, but you'll need to refer to those uh, for our uh, second and third hymns. We'll open this morning with a hymn of praise um, as we would seek to honor our Heavenly Father and recognize His goodness in our lives. Uh, would you uh, turn to him 197, crown him with many crowns? I'd uh, like to welcome you this morning, and we do that in the name of our God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And we know that we're only here because within our lives, um, we have heard the message of salvation, and that we have understood that um, we're not here for ourselves, we're not on this earth to... Uh, to satisfy our own desires, but we're here for a purpose. And we're here to experience the love of God, to understand his ways, and to choose them freely. And um, we're also here because we know that uh, without God, we would be nothing. But uh, that through him is our life and our happiness and our joy. Um, and so we come here because we know that we need him. Um, I'd like to read uh, several scriptures, and I'm not going to cite all of them just for time, uh, but I'd just like to lay a foundation uh, for our service this morning. What doth the Lord 
thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Let your heart rejoice, and behold how great the covenants of the Lord, and how great his condescensions unto the children of men. Behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord, and my heart pondereth continually upon the things which I have seen and heard. I beseech of you in the words of soberness that you would repent and come with full purpose of heart and cleave unto God as he cleaves unto you. Today, uh, as we have spoken of in class, I would... uh, Encourage us to consider our hearts, knowing that um, we're here because God's changed our hearts. And so um, he speaks to your heart, and he asks a response from your heart. And so I pray that we would come with, with a broken heart today and a contrite spirit willing to cleave unto those things which are good and to seek after those things which the Lord would have us to do. Um, We come together that we might be lifted up and have joy because of him. And so uh, that sort of influenced the songs that we'll sing today um, and the reflection that that I hope that they cause us to have this morning is that uh, what the Lord wants is not the random actions that we would do for him. But he does want a response from your heart. And so I hope that the the hymns that we sing speak to that today. I hope that the words that are brought today speak to that today. Our opening hymn will be from your insert, Give Me Thy Heart, and we will sing that together at this time.
Dear Holy Father, as we have gathered together, I would ask that your spirit would be in attendance. That uh, you would drown out the concerns of the world. That we would have peace. May we, uh, through that peace, be able to have a tender heart that we would be uh, receiving of the message this day. I would pray you would be with uh, my brother Richard. May he listen for your voice. May he speak those words you would have for him. And in Jesus' name I would pray, amen. We know that um, the, uh, the walk that we've entered in uh, being followers of God is something that, uh, uh, that's something that we do. Uh, we have the opportunity each and every day to decide how we will respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ. And... Um, the, the wonderful thing about that faith is that we know that faith is what we do because of what we know. And um, if we know Jesus Christ and we know his goodness, he gives us opportunities to do something with that. And so even though we do not uh, have plates or trays being passed at this time in front of us, we do know that within our lives, our God gives us opportunities for us to practice what we know. And part of that is aligning our lives with God's commandments. And one of the things that he desires from us is for us to understand that everything he gives us is so that we can be a blessing and so that we can return it back to him. And so even though it is a small task, even though the requirement is not so high, so great, to be a burden. Our opportunity to be a steward of our time, our monies, our talents is an opportunity to remind ourselves that God needs to be a part of everything that we do, that there are no parts of our lives that are separate. And so um, I would just take this opportunity uh, to remind us that our stewardship is not so much for everyone else, but it, it is for us. It is needed for us to remind us each and every day that God can be a part of everything that we do. And so it would encourage us to remember that part of our response as we go throughout the service. And I would also like to take an opportunity uh, to uh, introduce and welcome our, our speaker today. Um, we don't have a lot of guest speakers, um, or those who are, are not normally uh, with us. Um, but uh, there are so many wonderful brothers and sisters that uh, we don't know as well, and we're glad to get to know you better today. Um, I would like to welcome Richard Thompson uh, with us today. Um, he has uh, been involved in the church way longer than I have, um, but has been involved in uh, in stake and mission center leadership and uh, and uh, continues to be a servant for his Heavenly Father. Um, so I uh, would welcome here, him this day um, for his ministry. Thank you, brother. Our scripture reading today is uh, a simple one. 
and hopefully will reflect on what we're going to talk about. It comes from 1 John 4.20. If a man say, I love God, and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The Lord, the trumpet shall sound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Thank you. I appreciate the voice. I'm of the nature I sing by letter. I open up and let her fly because the Lord said make a joyful noise. He didn't say anything about beautiful and you have the beauty, sir. Thank you. I'm here because I went to Mission Center Conference, ran into two guys who I used to know, two railroaders, and... Uh, so I got the invite, and I'm pleased to be here. A question for you, and especially for the kids. How many of you kids have been in a snowball fight? Let's see your hands. Come on. How about some of you other older kids? You've been in a snowball fight? Okay, now let's see the hands of those who have been in a tomato fight. Oh, right over here, this fellow Rex, one fall, he and... Tim Brown had raised several acres of tomatoes, and I was helping a farmer hook up a piece of equipment when suddenly we began to be pelted by tomatoes. And let me assure you that uh, there's a big difference between a nice red juicy tomato and a green hard one. Rex asked me to share a testimony that I'd shared years ago about a crop of wheat that we raised. But it's inexorably entwined with tithing. That's something we don't hear much about anymore. It's sort of like sinful. You know, we, we want to connect sinful with chocolate or food. We don't want to connect it with our lives. We say we do something wrong in our life that's unhealthy. We don't say sinful. But tithing is an integral part of our lives, and Doris and I will be married 60 years next month. It's amazing how the Lord blesses you. And early on, we decided two things in our lives 
stewardship was one of them, and when we started the family, mom would stay home with the kids. In this day and age, that's not too easy. I was working at Ford that time, making about $200 a week clear, and that was pretty good money. And I quit to teach school for $75 a week, and a lot of times I shook my head. But over the years, we saw how the Lord blessed us as we stuck to those things. I worked a lot of extra jobs, weekends, nights, whenever we could to make ends meet, and the tithing kept accruing. It was amazing. Uh, we bought 10 acres out at Sibley. We needed a house and couldn't afford one, and found out the Fort Osage Votech School built a house every year. So we signed up. We were third on the list, and suddenly we were one. Lord moved those people out of our way, provided us a house. Terrible loan. Oh, my gosh, $11,500. I thought, I'd never pay that off. Today, you can't even buy a bad used car for that. But as the tithing continued, I, I began working uh, the extra jobs for Gleaners, their experimental station. And through that process of combines and tractors, I got acquainted with a lot of the farmers, and I would begin to trade time for use of equipment. So the goal was to plant the place to wheat. And if the Lord blessed us, that would pay off our tithing. And he did. Not only was it a bumper crop, but it was record prices. The two together not only paid off our tithing, but gave us a surplus. Now, I want to go on with another little testimony. Third Nephi, chapter 5, verse 100, talks about the Lord answering you before you can ask. Before you can even ask, he provides. After I retired from school, I started work at North Kansas City Hospital outside in the grounds department. In fact, I said I was a proctologist in the grounds department because I dealt with cigarette butts and a lot of people that acted like anal orifices, and there seemed to be a lot of both. But it was a large campus and uh, six office buildings and parking garages, and so you were issued a large set of keys. Uh, with that was an agreement that if you lost them, you'd be charged $1,500 to replace them. So we guarded them carefully. One morning, we were doing trash routes, still dark. I was doing an inside route, a young man named Sean doing the outside, when the radio crackled, and he said, I've lost my keys. In that instant, the Lord showed me exactly where his keys were laying. And though it was night, it was bright as day that I could see those keys. Now, isn't that a wonderful testimony? But you see, it wasn't for me. So I called Sean on the radio, and I said, go over to the Medical Plaza North dumpster about 10 feet to the right, and you'll find your keys. Silence. About 10 minutes later, I hear the diesel gator humming around the road, and here comes Sean, jumps out with a big grin and a ring of keys in his hands. I said, how do you know? Simple. The Lord showed me. Before I could even ask, that's, that's the marvelous thing. Before you can even ask, that's the God we worship. Okay, Scripture. Today we're in, if you have a King James Version of the Bible, we're in the Gospel of John. If you have an inspired version, we're in the Testimony of John. If you have one published by Paul Ludi, it will say the Testimony of John of Jesus Christ. I like the testimony of Jesus Christ. We're in chapter 8. This is a familiar passage of Scripture and one which I have struggled with. I preached on it last August and came up with more questions and frustration. And the Lord led me on a journey. And the first part of that journey is what the deacons, if they are somewhere back there, are going to pass out a cartoon. Uh, if you would pass those out to the people, please. It's a simple little cartoon, uh, 
And what I'd like for you to do is place this cartoon somewhere that, where you will see it every day. For some of us, it might be the front of the refrigerator. It might be the mirror in the bathroom. It might be the walkout door to the garage. So as we walk out to leave, it's the last thing we see. Some place where you see it every day. In this cartoon, it is simply Jesus addressing the Pharisees. And he's simply saying, you use the scriptures to determine what love is. And I use love to determine what the scriptures mean. That's the essence of what we're talking about. That's the essence of why Jesus Christ makes a difference in the scriptures is that love is at the root of all things. The second part of the solution to understanding this scripture came in a letter to the editor in a magazine I subscribed to, The Bar Magazine. Now, before you misunderstand that, that's not a magazine for barkeepers and a drink of the month club, but it's Biblical Archaeology Review. And it dealt with the mosaic floor tiles in the temple. Okay, so we're dealing with a cartoon here about love and an article on mosaic floor tiles. And that helped. And you're probably scratching your head, but I'm not sure I understand how those two things could give you some insight. Well, let's read the passage of Scripture. And I'm going to read what's in the King James Version because the inspired version adds a couple of phrases at the end, and I want to save those to a little later. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst of the people, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commands us, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest. You notice John's eyewitness account here. Went out one by one, beginning with the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst of the temple. And when Jesus had raised up himself and saw none of her accusers, and the woman standing, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. <clears throat> That's sort of a negative ending to what happened. And I want to phrase this for you so you understand it. Let's set the scene. Jesus is teaching the people in the temple. He's over here in the court of the women. It doesn't say that, but it said there were men, women, children, people there. They could be in the court of the women. Over here is the court of the men, just the men. Not even boys could be there. And between the two, and this is important, is the Nicanter Gate. It's up about 15 steps above the floor of the temple where Jesus was. This gate, you may remember when Mary and Joseph, after Jesus was born, on the 41st day after Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph went to this gate. Mary handed little Jesus to Joseph, and she went up to the gate, put coins in the mouth of some brass trumpets, and went in and went through a process of prayers and rituals and songs and some sort of drink and came back out, and now she was clean. The woman was considered unclean after she gave birth. And so now Mary and Joseph could go and present little Jesus in the temple because she was clean. So then the Cantor Gate 
dealt with cleansing, healing, forgiveness, and even judgment. Now, Jesus is using these 15 steps, like he often did, as sort of an amphitheater. The people are here sitting on the steps. Jesus is down here sitting on the floor teaching them. It was a natural situation. He did it in the country on hillsides. He did it along the beach, wherever it was convenient. And he's teaching them here. And in just a minute, he's going to be interrupted by this angry group of men coming in. But before we do that, I want to stop for just a second. At our house, our TV has about four stations. There's the Weather Channel, Turner Classic Movies, HGTV, and Hallmark. That's about all that ever goes on. Back about 05 or 06, Hallmark had a series called McBride. Dealt with a guy who was a defense attorney. What I particularly liked about the series was when the person would testify, they would recreate the scene with McBride standing by them so you could see exactly what happened. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to place you on the steps along with those other people there so you can see exactly what's going to transpire. And where are you from? Missouri. And what's Missouri? The show me state. Now, Jesus has been talking all these platitudes about love, peace, and harmony. All right, show me. Show me how you deal with people that come in angry. Show me how you take care of people who are hurting. I'm here to watch. I'm here to learn. Okay, you with me? All right. Long come the men. They come dragging this poor woman in. They've gone through the sheep's gate. They've drug her through Jerusalem proclaiming what she is to all who would listen. And now they come to the temple where normally they would take her to the Nicanter gate so the rabbi could judge her. But instead, they brought her to Jesus to trick him. They throw, push, shove her at his feet. And then they begin the harangue that this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. The law says she should be stoned. What do you say? It's a trap. Because if he says she should be stoned, then he's in trouble with the Romans because only the Romans had the power of life and death. Remember, even the Jews had to go to Pilate to get Jesus killed. If he says, oh, forgive her, love her, help her, no, then he's weak on the law. And so they can criticize him on that. Jesus outfoxes them. He doesn't do anything. He just stoops down and starts writing in the dust on the temple floor. But the Koran continues. They want to make their point. You know, the Pharisees were all about the law, the letter of the law, exactly what the law said. And now Jesus stands up and says, let he who's without sin cast the first stone at her. What did they do? They came to stone her, didn't they? Sort of dangerous. He's standing right by her. He might get hit too. Well, let me assure you, that's all Hollywood. Have you ever been to Branson to the Sight and Sound Theater? Oh, good. Our uh, daughters took us here recently to see that, and that's exactly what they show. Hollywood shows these guys carrying stones. In fact, some of the portrayals will say is their sins affected them, and they begin to leave. You hear the stones dropped. But Jesus knew that wasn't true. Where were they? They were in the temple, a place of worship, a sacred place, you read the 23rd chapter of Matthew, it says Zacharias was the last prophet that was killed in the temple at the altar, and it was such a furor over that it would never happen again. So Jesus knew there was no problem about these people going to throw stones at her. By the way, do you know what stoning really was? How that was accomplished? According to Josephus, and if you haven't read Josephus, he's an interesting guy, not a Roman, but a Jew. Actually, the person would be taken out to a prominent ravine, pushed off, and then stones thrown down on them. But have you ever done something so long that you sort of got lazy? 
Surely human nature wouldn't get lazy, would they? And Josephus says that what they had started to do instead of that, because that's, you know, got to clean that up. That's a bloody mess. So they would just take a cord and choke them. Be over in two minutes, no blood, no mess. Jesus knew all that. He knew that wasn't going to happen. But he put the sin right back on them. And they were convicted by their sins. He stoops down again and continues to write, not even paying attention to what's going on, and they begin to leave one by one. Now, there's something that we need to back up here. I don't want to go too far. Let's go back to the law, since the Pharisees are all about the law. The law said that a man and woman taken at adultery should be, and this is Leviticus, killed. Doesn't say stoned. It says killed. To find where it says stoned, we have to go to the 22nd chapter of Deuteronomy, and we find that it's a whole different situation. Have you seen the movie Fiddler on the Roof? There's a guy that comes out and he sings tradition. I could hear you singing that, sir. Tradition. Because the Jews were all about tradition. And when a girl turned 13, she was betrothed to an older man, probably 17. And when she was about 15, then she and the man who's now about 19 would be married. Okay, in the 22nd of Deuteronomy, we find that this situation is a young girl who is betrothed and is found to be pregnant. And her husband-to-be says, uh-uh, I'm not responsible for this. You say, well, Richard, how did they know she was pregnant? Well, I'm sorry, ladies, but Mother Nature has a way of indicating that you're pregnant after a few months. Some sources actually say that this woman was drugged through the streets naked so that all could see her sin. Now, I want you to think back for a minute. When you were, say, 15, you know, I, I was almost embarrassed to go to school if I had a new zit. That's why I used clear to try to cover it up. Or maybe mom's washer broke down and, and I had to wear some old clothes. But can you imagine being drugged through the streets? How embarrassing, accused of something terrible. And your future husband is saying, I'm not having anything to do with you. And her father, who was probably a businessman, realized this would be bad for business. He said, we're disowning you. And so we have this young girl alone by herself at Jesus' feet, humiliated. Now, what you probably don't realize is that her father and the bridegroom-to-be are in this crowd of men to see that justice is carried out. How alone would you be? She didn't know Jesus. He's a stranger. Here she is at his feet. So no man, just her. But really the man's in the audience accusing her. So what did Jesus write on the floor? And trust me, there have been volumes written about what Jesus wrote on the floor. Some people say that he wrote the men's names and their sin. And when they saw that, that convicted them and they left. Some people say he wrote the law. Well, one thing's for sure. Who was the closest to what he was writing? The woman. But you see, they didn't teach women to read or write. So whatever he wrote was of no concerned to her she couldn't read it anyway women were the first teacher of children 
for the first five years, but it was all taught to them the scriptures by rote, not by learning to read and write. So it didn't deal with her. So what did it deal with? Well, let's take a little test here for a minute. I've written a word on a piece of paper. Do you read that okay? Read that okay? All right. Now, what you have to remember is that they're sitting on the other side. So what they would see would be the word upside down and backwards. Now, does that make any sense to you? No. So there's another explanation. And who are we dealing with here? The Pharisees, the legal guys? Okay. So let's go to the fifth chapter of Leviticus. I think it's verses 22 through 27. And you see the law provided for exactly this situation. It's called the Sota. And in that process, the woman who was accused of being unfaithful was taken to the Nicanter Gate. Where are we? Right here at the Nicanter Gate. And she was given bitter water to drink. And the Lord, not man, the Lord would judge whether she was innocent or guilty. And if she was innocent, she would be fine. If she were guilty, she would get sick and the child would be miscarried. Now, what was the bitter water made out of? Water and the dust from the temple floor. See, Jesus is drawing, I believe, the geometric figures in the tile, in the dust, trying to remind these Pharisees, you're the legal guys who follow the law, and here's the law on how to let the Lord judge us, and you're ignoring it. So here, get the clue. Do the sota. And they don't get the clue, so he gives up. He lays it on them about their own sins. And then he goes back down, hoping maybe they'll still get the idea. You see how Jesus is turning the very law that the Pharisees want to impose on him against them. How many times did the Pharisees win when they went up against Jesus? They didn't. They never did. Now, I would... In my research, I found one I thought was interesting. Jesus says, let he who's without sin cast the first stone at her. Our Arab Christian brothers, and don't be thrown off by Arab because there are a lot of Arab Christians, they translate that, that Jesus said, let he who's without sin cast the first stone at me. And wouldn't that have been more intriguing to the Pharisees that could actually throw it at him? Okay. We're to the point where Jesus stands up because there's nobody else there. He's next to the woman. She stands up and he says, woman, where are thine accusers? And she says, there are none. And he said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Well, if he didn't accuse her, why did he say go and sin no more? And I think there's an important lesson here. When in the Jewish law, if a woman were sexually assaulted and she cried out, don't stop, help, she was considered innocent. If she didn't cry out, she was considered guilty. But psychologists tell us that women who are sexually assaulted sometimes are so paralyzed with fear that they couldn't cry out. And so Jesus is saying to this woman, cry out. I'm giving you the voice to cry out when you see something wrong. Remember, this is a woman that lives in a society where she has no rights. Cry out when you see something wrong. There are many scholars who believe that this woman living in a large extended family was the victim of an uncle's sexual abuse for years. And finally, come to the point where it all came out but her family disowned her. You say, well, you know, this would-be husband, what kind of guy was he? Could, couldn't he look the other way and say, oh, honey, I'll forgive you. We'll raise this child together. 
Uh, here we are back to tradition again. Because Jewish tradition, if that was a boy, and 50% of the chance it would be a boy, would become the head of the family and have all the family riches. And what if that, the real father of that child was not a member of our tribe? Or worse yet, what if he were a Gentile? Uh, that couldn't be. We couldn't take that chance. So here she is alone. Jesus has said, now, go and sin no more. I give you a voice to talk out and speak out about what's wrong. Now, finally, we come to the passage that's in the inspired version. That's not in King James. And the woman glorified God from that hour and believed on his name. You see, Jesus had been here to win her heart before he ever speaks to her to win her mind. And now, here's the essence of this message. Here is a woman abandoned by her family, abandoned by her would-be husband. And what happens next? You know, look around you. You're in the bleachers. You see these people jumping up, going down to surround her, to welcome her into the faith because she's glorified God. She's become one of the followers. That's what the church does. We talked about it that in class. The church welcomes those who are outcast. Bring them into the fold. I can see the widow ladies coming down and surrounding her, especially if she were naked, to give her a coat to cover her and say, come live with my family. We'll raise your child together. And you say, Richard, what do you mean widows? How could you guess that there would be widows in that group? Statistics. By the time this young girl was 13 and betrothed, 30% of all fathers had died from war, battle, disease, or accidents. By the time she would have been 15, 40% of all the fathers would have died. Think back in the scriptures. We see Joseph and Mary take Jesus when he's 12 to the Passover in Jerusalem, we never hear of Joseph again in the scriptures. Many feel that he died when Jesus was a teenager. So there are widows here who surround this lady and welcome her. They welcome her to a group of people who are loving, who will nurture her. And if that isn't the call of what this church is about and what Jesus Christ is about, then I can only fall back to the cartoon that I gave you, which says, love is the root of all of our scriptures. And that's the only way I can find love in this scripture that Jesus shared with them. I think he's been out in the cedar bushes. I wanna give you a homework assignment, no educator would be complete without a homework assignment, right? Well, someday when you're feeling sort of blue or funky and yeah, life's sort of tough, once you get in your car and drive up to River and Walnut, there where the temple and auditorium are, turn north on River Boulevard and Drive north up to Wayne City Landing. That's at the end of River Boulevard. If you're hungry or thirsty, you go 24, there's High Boy and Wendy's there. I get you a Coke or a malt and sandwich and go up there to Wayne City Landing. It's marked. They have benches there and plaques. Sit down and relax a little bit and look out over the river valley. It's a lot different now than it was. We're going to turn the clock back to November 6, 1833. The river there is about a mile wide. That's the main landing for steamboats long before Kansas City was in, in existence. And it was also uh, the place of a ferry to cross to Clay County. The Saints, under pressure from the authorities, have surrendered 52 rifles because they were 
always being questioned about being hostile and wanting to take over. So they have surrendered these rifles under the guarantee of protection from the authorities, and of course this is a ruse. Now men on horseback are threatening the saints, giving them two hours to leave or be shot. The saints are desperately gathering wagons, possessions they could throw in a wagon, a buckboard, or a backpack to carry. It's raining, it's cold, and they began gathering at Bishop Partridge's house. It's now snowing, and they begin the process of going right up what now is River Boulevard to Wayne City Landing to catch the ferry across the river to safety in Clay County. It's dark by the time they get there, and they're strung out for a mile up and down the river, huddling on the river bank. The men are desperately trying to get wet wood as the snow continues to fall to burn a fire. Under a woven rug, two women will give birth that night there on the river bank. You've given birth, ladies, imagine in the cold, wet bank, bringing new life into a situation like that. November 7th will dawn clear and cold, and the men immediately start cutting cottonwood limbs because they could take four or five together, wrap a blanket around it, make a teepee, and provide some warmth. The townspeople come out to see the vanquished saints and what they find is a terrible mess of people huddled along the river. Many will return home with and bring coats and food to them. What do you think the saints are doing? They're praying. That night, actually November 8th, about 2 a.m. in the morning, the sky turns red with fire. It's the greatest recorded meteor storm, not a meteor shower, a meteor storm that lasted for an hour. The saints rejoice because they recognize it as the Lord's hand answering their prayers and helping them along the way. The townspeople think it's the end of the world and want to go out and beg the saints to come back. So as you sit there and enjoy your frosty malt, your hamburger and things maybe have weighed down a little bit too much on you, think about the saints and all the problems that they had before them, but they had the assurance that God loved them. Now here's the secret. He loves you too. As we bring our service to a close today, we'll sing the, the insert, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. And um, as we sing that, it's a simple song. Um, you might be able to sing it without the, without the words. But I would encourage you to read, uh, to sing that um, as, a, as a prayer. Um, 
offer those words up into your Heavenly Father. Because uh, out of God's love for us, we have the opportunity to return that love back. And we do that through what we do every day. So I pray that uh, we might offer the intents of our heart this day as we sing that closing hymn.
our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, we approach your throne at this time with praise in our hearts for the opportunity to be here and to hear the words that your servant has brought. And Father, might we dwell on those words and might we do those things that would be so pleasing in your sight and our service to you and our fellow man. Father, be with those who could not be with us today, that you might, that they might join us next Sunday as we strive to continue to learn of you and to grow closer to you. And so it is, Father, that I would offer this benediction on this service. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.